turn back over to John chapter 19. The verse is read by Reverend Andrews. Um, All right. <clears throat> verses 26 and 27. It says, and so when Jesus saw his mother and the disciple who was dear to him, he said to his mother, Mother, there is your son. Mm -hmm. Then he said to the disciple, There is your mother. Mm -hmm. And from that hour, the disciple, disciple took her to his house. Right. Um, want to um, use for a subject this morning as we look uh, back at this third word from the cross, um, a change in relationship. A change in relationship. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for this day. Father, we're thankful for all that you do and all that you've done. Mm -hmm. Father, we're thankful that you've allowed us to be here one more time. Mm -hmm. But Father, as we have been in this meeting, this time together in worship to you, Father God, it, it, we realize that if all of us speak and you don't speak, we would have wasted our time. Oh, yeah. Amen. So, Father God, do not penalize your people for my poor performance, but Father God, speak through me that yeah. they may be blessed and yeah. touched yeah. by you. Yeah. Father God, yeah. fill me up, Father God, that I might be used by you, that they, they might be blessed, <laughs> and that we might be made to change us, Father God, so that we may change others, that we may change this nation, this world, and all all through our community. As in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. So when Jesus saw his mother and the disciple who was dear to him, he said to his mother, Mother, there was your son. Yes. And he said to the disciple, There was your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his house. A change in relationship. You know, we sit here and as we walk down through uh, these lessons from the cross and we talk about um, what Jesus said and what he meant. I think it's necessary for us to understand sometimes that when we come together um, as Christian brothers and sisters, sometimes we forget that, that, that a change has occurred. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It becomes easy for us to, 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 to fall back onto those things that naturally feel comfortable for us. It feels natural, it's natural for me to feel, and it's comfortable for me to feel connected to my heritage. Where I grew up, mm -hmm. who, I, who I played with, mm -hmm. who I went to school with, who I ate dinner with, or who I uh, uh, played basketball with, uh, those things in our history uh, that are a part of uh, the history of our lives, those natural things when we look back, it becomes easy to fall back into uh, the comfort of those memories Amen. and the comfort of those people that are encased in those memories. Mm -hmm. But I offer up this morning um, that while we do that always on a regular basis, always looking back over our life and looking back over our life, trying to use those memories sometimes by way, a way uh, in which we can surmise the quality and, and the quantity of our life, that it becomes necessary for us sometimes to remember that, uh, that we have had changes in relationship, and that's the thing that keeps us coming to this, this part place day after day, Sunday after Sunday, week after week, year after year. It's because there's been some change in our relationship. Right. Yes, I am from my, I was born of my mother and my father. Yes, I have brothers and sisters who are, who are my brother that I grew up with. I have brothers and sisters all over the place. Yes, I have cousins and aunts and uncles and nieces and nephews mm -hmm. and all those nice things. However, I must remember that, that, that the family that I grew up with in South Florida is not the only family that I have. All right. I must remember that the family that lives in my house is not the only family that I have. All right. But the reality of it is, is that even um, as now as a Christian, I am connected via relationship to a new set of family. When you look at the, 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 the church and you look at all of us who call ourselves Christians, I believe sometimes the problem that we have is that we put an asterisk next to the word Christian. Uh -huh. And the problem is that it was never, that was never meant to be an asterisk there in the first place. Uh -huh. 
We say stuff like I'm a black Christian, or I'm a white Christian, or I'm a Christian disciple of Christ, or I'm a Methodist, or I'm a Protestant, or, or, or a Presbyterian, Presbyterian, or something. We always want to put an attitude there by which we denominate, delineate who we are. I'm Presbyterian. Well, I'm Southern Baptist. I'm, 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 I'm Missionary Baptist. And the reality of it is, none of it is right, all of it is wrong, because there's only one Christ. And if all of us claim to be connected to the same Christ, we're all part of the same church. And if we're all part of the same church, we're all part of the same family. Yeah. The issue that we have in the text this morning is that, the, that we see Jesus still hanging on the cross. Uh -huh. And Jesus, while hanging on the cross, um, looks down and realizes that there is family uh, all around him. Mm -hmm. Here's the issue, though. The issue is that when you look at the text, the text does not all name all that they said that all of his family is there. But family is in the picture. Uh -huh. If you back up one verse, it says that at, sitting at the foot of the cross was his mother Mary and her sister. But with Mary and her sister was Mary the wife of Cleopas and Mary Magdalene. Mm -hmm. So we had these four women at the foot of the cross, along with John, who calls himself the beloved disciple. Now I don't know why he calls himself the beloved disciple, maybe because he felt that his relationship with Christ was more special than everybody else, because he's the only disciple that calls him the beloved disciple. Mm -hmm. But I, but but you know he has the right to have that point of view because he wrote the book. However, it's, what is interesting to note is who is missing from the foot of the cross. Oh. Because we understand, Revelations, that Jesus was not an only child. All right. He is the firstborn child of his mother Mary. He is the adopted child of his father, his, his earthly father, Joseph. But Mary and Joseph had other children after Jesus. Uh -huh. If you look at Matthew chapter 13, in Matthew chapter 13, it says that there were other children James and uh, Joseph and uh, Judas, and then he has sisters who are not named. Mm -hmm. So Jesus is left with, was not an only child, he is the firstborn child of his mother, but he has four other brothers and a host of other sisters. Uh -huh. However, none of his brothers and sisters are at the foot of the cross. Mm -hmm. And that how it is that people that are connected to a people that sometimes have accept the same blood and the same mama and daddy who grew up in the house with you, who played, you know, hopscotch with you, who did all those things. But in the moment of the crisis of your life, those people who say they love you, who call you cubs and bro and bro and sis and honey are not there at the moment of your greatest need. Oh, yeah. Right. So it becomes necessary for us to relook at um, this thing because, you know, it's, been, it's funny because I believe that, the, that what Jesus does in this context is create a new family dynamic. Amen. And, you know, we have this word now that we think is new, this blended family. Uh -huh. Well, I offer up that if, if you've ever been in a church that way back before now that the church it um, started the, the, the idea of a blended family. Amen. Because the Bible says, go ye therefore and teach all nations, oh. baptizing them in the Father, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Oh, so yeah. if you go into all nations and bring all people together in the name of Jesus Christ, you are creating a blended family. Yes. So this idea of blended families that we just came out the last five or ten years, trying to find a way in which we categorize families that are not we consider non-traditional, it's not a new concept. However, I offer up this morning that family is not always those who have your bloodline, but family are those who have your heart. Amen. And I offer up this morning that the church, when it operates as it should operate, when it looks <laughs> the way it's supposed to look, looks more like a family. Yes. For it is in for families come together in times of trial and tribulation. Real family comes together when things get tough. Yes. Amen. There's Jesus in this moment. He is dealing with the people that are going around, on around him. He's been beat. He's been whipped. He's been spat on. He's had a crown of thorn on his head. They put nails in his hands and his feet. They lifted him up. He's had an argument with two thieves. Mm -hmm. And he asked God to forgive everybody. Oh, yeah. Now here in the moment when he is dying, Jesus pauses the, his dying to take a moment to recreate the family. Oh, yeah. And I'm glad he did. Yeah. I'm glad he does because so many times 
We get hung up on who we're related to, who we came from, who our, our grandparents were, who our parents were, who our aunts and uncles were, and that's great. All that stuff is fine. But however, no matter how much I love my great grandfather and my grandfather, neither one of them can get me into heaven. That's right. Thank you, Lord. Neither one of them can write a check. Neither one of them can do whatever. There, there was a time when I could go to Orlando or go to Vigo Beach or some places and people would know that, who, that I was a, a member of the Robinson. I could walk into a store and just say, put it on their account. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I'm a member of a new family now, Reverend Akins. <laughs> and I may not be able to go into Walmart and say, put it on somebody's account, but it happened. All right. Where, where, where it matters, where my sins get recorded, when it comes time for me to stand before the seat of judgment, then the devil will say what he has to say. And let's be honest, in that moment, he will not be lying because what he talks about about our lives will be the truth. But Jesus will be there saying, zero at the total because it's put on my account. All right. Because you're in the family. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What's interesting in this text this morning is that Jesus has 12 disciples that he picked. He had over 250 that followed him, but there were 12 that he picked out of the 250 right, that he called personally and were part of his inner circle. Of that inner circle, there were three that he picked that were his armor bearers that walked with him, um, and in particular, Jesus, or Peter, James, and John. Of that three, only one is at the foot of the cross in the moment when he needs them the most. Mm. Yes. Oh, what does that say? What does that say? It doesn't matter how big the crowd is. Right. Doesn't matter how, many, how much people say they love you or like you. Doesn't matter how many friends you have on Facebook, how many people follow you on other social media. It does not matter how many people honk at you when they, as, they, as, they, as they drive down the road and they pass your house. What matters is in the moment when you need somebody that God will put at least one person in your life and stop complaining because you only got one and be thankful that you get that one and that one will be all you need. Amen. Amen. But what's interesting in the text, Jesus stops dying to pay attention to what's going on and in the moment he stops thinking about himself. And starts thinking about his family. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now here's the thing. Mm -hmm. By the time Jesus starts his journey, Joseph, his father, is dead. Uh -huh. Joseph is dead, and in the Hebrew tradition, Joseph dying it puts Jesus in charge of the family. All right. So now the care, the protection, the provision for his mother falls rest squarely on his shoulders. Amen. Ever, it doesn't matter how many brothers and sisters you have. It doesn't matter how many people, how many family and friends you have. When your father dies, if you are the firstborn son, it all falls on you. Mm -hmm. So Jesus, in this moment of dying, looks down, sees his mother, and remembers the tradition and says, I cannot leave my mother out there floating in the wind. All right. Because let's be honest, in this moment, my brothers ran. Mm. My sisters, they said the class citizens, they can't do nothing. They can't help themselves. Mm. So I need to leave my mother with somebody I can trust. All right. And you know, uh, I've got a few friends, Reverend Akins, that didn't grow up in the church. Um, I know some of y'all, all your friends have always been in church. You always know everybody that was church folks. They always went to church. They always paid their tithes. They were, they, they were serving on the usher board and all that. But I have a few friends who did not go to church when we were growing up. Uh -huh. I've got a few friends who on the time they ever uh, went in the church door when there was a wedding or a funeral. Mm -hmm. I have some friends that, that those the only time you ever saw them in church. Somebody was crying and dying or somebody was laughing and shouting. Mm -hmm. That was it. They didn't do Sunday morning service. They didn't do Tuesday night Bible study. They didn't do Sunday night Bible study. They didn't do Sunday night Bible study. BTU. They only came to church when they had to come to church, and that was all right with them. Right. However, what was interesting in some of the toughest moments of my life, those were the people who came and put their arms around me and said, Kev, don't worry about it. Everything's going to be all right. Amen. And so we cannot discount people that because they are or are not who we think they should be as to whether or not they are worth and that they deserve our worth. Amen. But when you get that preacher, Jesus looks down. Mm -hmm. Sees his mother, realizes that those boys, those four brothers that were the 
the church every Sunday. Uh-huh. Realize those four brothers that got baptized like he got baptized. Realize that those four brothers who grew up in the same house, eating the same showbread and the same uh, man, and eating the same fruit from the same table, and eating the same porridge and puff pudding and stuff made by the same woman, when she needed her the most to be there in the moment, they were nowhere to be found. Mm. Mm-hmm. So he's got to go back to one of his homeboys. Somebody that didn't grow up in the house. Mm-hmm. Somebody who wasn't a part of you know, the family. And he's got to create a new family dynamic in order to save his mother. Yes. So Jesus looks at Mary and realizes that before I go on and secure her salvation, I've got to secure her, 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 her physically in this moment. So he looks down and sees John at the foot of the cross. And he does for, for both of them Wait, and physically, what he is trying to do for them spiritually. Mm-hmm. He connects them. He says to her, woman, there's your new son. Mm-hmm. Son, there's your new mom. Mm-hmm. And, what, and what he does is he creates a new relationship that's not based on bloodline uh, or physical, but it's based on spiritual principle. He creates a new family that's not based on where you grew up, but on who you choose to serve. He Creates a new family that's not based on how you look, where you come from, but where you are in this moment and who you choose to serve. Yeah. When you get that pastor, if you are a Christian, if you are a born again believer, you are a part of a new family. Oh yes. And it doesn't mean that you disconnect from your mama, your sisters, your brothers, your aunts, uncles, cousins, your grandmother. You can yeah. still pick up the phone and call your nana and send her Christmas card on Christmas. You can still do all of that stuff. However, what we must remember that is that you are now part of a blended family. Yeah. You're part of the people. Your family with some people who didn't come from where you came from, who don't necessarily look like you look, who don't always sound the way you sound, and because... The only thing, the thing that binds you is not blood relationship or last name, but it's belief in a God that will not fail. Amen. And the church has got to get back to that point where we act like friends. All right. We got to get back Amen. to that place where we look at each other and say, it's not the color of your skin, it's not the content of, uh, of your hair, it's not how tall you are, it's not um, where you went to school, it's not any of that, because none of that stuff matters. Because none of that stuff gets you into heaven, but it is the fact that you feel like Romans 10 and 9, you believe in your heart, and you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ, and that God has called you, and that you are saved, and you're now a part of the body of Christ. Yeah. And because you're a part, part of the body of Christ, you got new brothers and new sisters and new people that you are connected to. Yes. Yes. We're a blended family. Yes. There's a change of relationship. We are no longer just neighbors and and, 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 and people who know each other. We're not family. Mm -hmm. And the reality of it is, I believe that if we really looked at at, at this world and we really you know, got people to the place where they really know Jesus, it would be easy for us then to start acting like we got sense. Because you were allied family. Amen. The problem I have is the problem my grandfather had with me at about 17. I, I think I told you the story before that myself and my cousin Snapper got into a fight at my grandfather's house over some silly matters. And one rule that my grandfather, my great grandfather always said that as family, you never fight. Because you can always work it out. You yeah. should so love each other enough to figure out how to work it out without being a big mess. Yeah. And so the fact that we were fighting, physically fighting, in his house made him mad. Uh-huh. It made him sick. And he kicked us out of the house. Man, man told us we couldn't eat at his table until we fixed whatever the mess was. Uh-huh. Round them, but this is, I believe, that some of us are making God sick because we are calling ourselves Christians. We said we're part of the body of Christ, but we are watching people fuss and fight. Yeah. And nobody's calling them out on it. All right. Amen. I said this a couple of seconds ago. My issue with what happened in Charlottesville was that you had people on both sides who called themselves Christians. Mm-hmm. But nobody, but, but, but there were a lot of people that weren't acting very Christ like. And that is an issue. Because if I'm a Christian, I can always come back to the point, to that point and start at that point. And see, you've got to be very careful with people, Reverend who call on the name of God, but who do not talk about Jesus Christ. Right. Because. There are a whole lot of people that say God, but 
never talk about Jesus. Yes. And so we've gotten this burden thing back to do you believe in God? And people say yes, so we go on thing today. But the reality of it is we need to sit down and have conversations, have face-to-face -face meetings, one-on-one -on -one counsel with people to understand, do you believe in the same Jesus I believe in? Do you believe in him who died for us and was risen again on the third day? Do you believe on the fact that he caused all of us to repent us and that and through him all of us are saved? And because of him all of us are the same? Uh-huh. Because if you believe that, they have to believe that all of us are family. The way you get that, that preach. The Bible says that Jesus is our elder brother. He, he is God's firstborn among many sons and daughters. And so if you believe in Jesus Christ, if you've been baptized by the blood, you are now a son or daughter of God. That means everybody you come in contact with as a Christian is your brother or sister. Your family. It doesn't matter where they came from. It doesn't matter what language they speak. It doesn't matter what they look like. It doesn't matter their education or, or their social economic status. You are a family. And if anything happens as family, we ought to be prepared to come together and rally around each other and let us, let us remind each other, doesn't matter what it looks like, what name, whatever we tie, the reason we call ourselves Christians is because God does take care of us. Uh -huh. God does deliver us. God does make us whole. And we're going to stand next to each other because, of what, not just because of what it looks like, we're going to stand together with each other because we know who we come from. Amen. We know who we're connected to. And what's interesting in the text, I believe he gives Mary to John and John to Mary because in the moment of our crucible, he, God realizes that sometimes we need people yes. Yes. to help us get through the moment. That's right. I don't always need somebody to fix what's, what I'm going through. But every now and then I need somebody to write, remind me that Jesus is a way maker, to remind me that Jesus is a heart to remind me that no matter what's going on, everything will be all right because him who called us at this moment will keep us through the moment. Amen. And so I need somebody. None of us are so big or so bad or so holy or so heavy that we don't need anybody. All of us will need somebody at some time. And sometimes the people you think were supposed to be there because y'all grew up in the house together. Y'all played hot scotch together. Y'all played double dust together. And that person may fail you or fall by the wayside and not answer the phone, not stop by the house. But God will give you somebody who will be right there. And, and in verse 27, it's interesting because I want us to pay, pay particular attention to John's response. John's response in the text is critical to being a blended family, mm -hmm. to have a changed relationship. Because in the text, let's, let, 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 let's be honest, what Jesus was saying to John is that you are now responsible for all of Mary's affairs. You're responsible for her eating. Mm -hmm. You're responsible for her having water. You're responsible for her having a place to sleep. You're responsible for her medical care. You're responsible for uh, making sure her clothes get washed. You're responsible for making sure she makes her, you know, the, her doctor for me sometimes. You're responsible for making sure that everything she needs is taken care of. You're responsible for making sure that if somebody tries to attack her, that you are defending her. Amen. So this was no light assignment. Uh, mm -hmm. But look at John's response. For the text says, after Jesus said it, that same hour, John took Mary to his house. Amen. Amen. He took her straight away. There wasn't no argument. There, there wasn't no, I, I gotta say that's in my budget. I, I gotta see if I got time for this. I gotta go. I gotta go call somebody and make sure. I need to get a lawyer to talk about the legal ramifications of this transaction. We had to talk about nothing. nothing. Jesus said it, and John did it as soon as he heard it. Right. And because even though this is not my biological mama, she didn't raise me, she didn't nurse me, she never cooked me bread, she never did any of that stuff. But because Jesus says that she's family, I'm gonna take ownership. Amen. See, with family comes liability. Mm -hmm. Amen. We, we don't like that word in 2017. Because we're not going to be so legalistic, and that's why the lawyers make so much money. 
because everybody wants to be legalistic. And what about when talk about what their legal rights are, or how they can or cannot sue, or do all these things. But the, the reality of it is, is as family, there is liability. I've got to care how you feel. I've got to care about what you're going through. I've got to be concerned with your well-being because I'm part of family there's liability. And so I cannot simply turn my back. Even when I'm mad, I've got to make sure that you're all right. Even when there's an issue, I can't just say I don't care about you because there's not liability in Christ. Mm -hmm. And so John's reaction to the word that he heard um, is critical in the life of the church because we have a problem in church right now. At church, we don't want to deal with the fact of spiritual liability. Man. Can, can we be honest? Sure. The reason why some of those people are able to say and do the stuff they're able to say and do with so much brazenness, the reason why we have kids growing out of school that should never have flunked out of school, the reason we have people on drugs that should never be on drugs, the reason we have corruption in our government that should never be in our government is because people in the body of Christ are afraid to accept their liability and stand up and open their mouths and walk the streets and pray and do stuff that we are called to do as Christians each and every day. And because we don't take liability, the world is going to hell. I asked this question um, this past week. Because it was all in the news about Paula White and her comments about Donald Trump and Roland Martin and other people took her to task over that. I asked this question. I said, um, some of my friends, I said, myself included, a whole lot of us have been to manifest. A whole lot of us have been to some of these huge churches. A whole lot of us have to go to these conferences and spend all of this money. And you know, Reverend Sheila, you can tell them, this conferences ain't cheap. That's true. They, you know, you go to a conference, they want $250 just to register. Then ain't nobody asking you what you're saying or what you're eating or what you're wearing or how you're going to get there. That ain't cover nothing but just put a badge around your neck and give you a little booklet of paper and tell them you can look it up. They ain't worried about how you're getting there. You still got to get there on your own. So I need you guys to do all that stuff. However, the people rip, rip and run these conferences with all these people who want to talk about leadership and self-development and church development and you know, you know, ascending to your destiny. The destiny of the church is to save souls. Leaders in the church, that's your only job to convince people to save souls, to stand up for what's right. And all these people that call themselves preachers and prophets and all this stuff, I ask the question, where y'all at? Where, where ain't nobody standing up and saying nothing? Everybody got a new book that went to the Bible, but nobody's talking about the issues in the community. And so we got to pull back and get rid of some of this commercialism and get rid of some of this showmanship and get back to the Word of God and realize that we're all family and stop teaching people that we got to have the nomination and all this other stuff that we're all one family that's getting together and start teaching each other the truth. Because the truth is, one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. One family. One family. I, I was messaging with my cousin that's in Texas about the stuff that's going on with this hurricane. I wanted to make sure she was all right. I actually got a little nervous because I realized I got up this morning that she didn't message me back last night, so I sent her another message. But, you know, I, she told me the other day that she was okay. And so I was and so I'm like, okay, maybe she'll get by. So I'm to church. I'll check my messages, see what's going on with my cousin Danny. My cousin Keisha, excuse me. And so, but even though she's in Texas and I'm in Virginia now, we're still family. Mm -hmm. yeah. And just because I'm not in Texas dealing with a hurricane in Texas, it does not mean I'm not concerned about her well-being. Because she's not just her, she's got children in Texas. And I'm concerned about her and her children in Texas. Well, can I raise that up a little bit higher? It doesn't matter that you're here in Floyd County. You have brothers and sisters all over this planet. And if you see them going through something, if you see a storm coming on the horizon, if you see trouble in getting in their way, you ought to be concerned about that and be reaching out and saying, hey, is there anything we can do? Is there something you want us to do? I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to send you some aid. I'm going to do something. If there's somebody that, that says something that you know is wrong, you know what? When I was a little kid, you could say anything about my brother. I'll tell you, say something about it if you want to. It'll be the last thing you say. 
We're going to have issues. There will be conflict. Speak carefully, there will be consequences and repercussions. Say something about my brother. It's free, it's free speech in this country, but speech comes with the, the, the yo. Consequence. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. However, we see people that we know are good people. We see people who we know are, are striving to be better than Christ. And we listen to people who don't know the heart of the person, but they simply talk bad about their struggle. And we let them talk. Yeah. And our apathy or inaction <laughs> is worse Damn. than their action. Amen. Because they're, if they're not a part of the body, we expect them to have something bad to say. Right. But if I call myself a part of the body, then I am the last person that should sit idly by knowing that somebody is doing something wrong and have nothing to say. And the church has been way too silent for way too long. We've co-signed way too much stuff. Yes. Because we've forgotten that we're family. Amen. Christ changed our relationship. Mm -hmm. It's time for us to walk out the chain of relationship. It's time for us to do what John did. He heard the voice of Christ. And he simply did what he heard. Mm -hmm. And the scripture says in the text that he took care of Jesus' mother to, to the end of her days. And treated her as a part of his family. Yeah. And even though John ends up Dying on the island of Patmos. Jesus' mother lives out her days well taken care of because she was a part of a new family. Mm -hmm. There was a change of relationship. And it was not that her blood children did it, it was her spiritual son that did it. Yeah. And we have to be careful when we deal with people, not to just be so concerned with the people who we like us, not just be so concerned with the people who we, we have blood relationship with, but if we're part of the body of Christ. We have to be concerned with everybody. Right. Yeah. Every place. Mm -hmm. Everywhere. Because there's a change in our relationship. Mm -hmm. So I ask you this morning as I close. What's your relationship like? Mm -hmm. Are you simply calling on, on God? Or are you walking in, in the name of Jesus? Mm -hmm. What's your relationship like? Do you simply lean and depend on those people? that you grew up with, that, that, that's in your house? Or are you curious and do you care about those people who also call the name Jesus? And here's the thing. When the, in the scripture he says, if my people wow. who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and turn from the wicked ways and seek my face, <laughs> then will I hear from heaven and heal their land. If you're part of the body of Christ, you're in his people. But here's the thing. Everybody. Everybody on the planet. 